All right, those of you that were here, either by way of live stream or present in the sanctuary last Sunday, I've got good news. I have my notes printed. I really do. I just want to, I know I said thank you one time and without belaboring it, just um, both um, Matt Bundy, Caleb, Noah, just really worked hard to make this, um, this work well and I just really appreciate their efforts. So to you guys, thank you for your hard work. Um, if you want to follow along with the reading of scripture today, I have two texts, just like I did several weeks ago, same two texts in fact, that I'm going to ask you to find. Uh, Romans chapter 3. 24 through 26. You'll find that one, hold it, and then go over and find 1 John 4, 9 through 11. I'll repeat those a couple of times. You'll find the Romans 3, 24 through 26 passage. Hold your Bible open there. <clears throat> That'll be the first text I'm going to read. And then the second text, and the one I'll actually be preaching from, 1 John. It's 1 John, chapter 4, 9 through 11. This is the continuation of our series on the nature of the atonement. It's really a series on the atonement. We first looked at the necessity of the atonement, and then over the last several weeks we've been looking at the nature of the atonement. So, anybody need me to repeat those Bible verses? Romans chapter 3, 24 through 26. That would be the first one. Put your thumb in there and hold that. Second one is 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Okay? Give you just a second to make sure you got both of them, and then I'll begin reading. We're going to read the Romans text first. Then I'm actually going to pause. I'm going to read two other Bible passages. Because in this series, and then I'll close with the 1 John text. So in this, in this series... Um, We've looked at the nature, that is the definition. Like if you were a scientist and you wanted to look at the work of the atonement, you would say, how do I label it? How do I understand it? What is it? I was a biologist, I was going to crack it open and look at the atonement from that perspective. That's what we mean by what's the nature of it. We examine it. What is it? It is an act of obedience. It is an act of sacrifice. And then to, those are previous sermons. And then today, it is a propitiation. And you're going to see that word in all four of the Bible passages I'm going to read. So this is Romans 3, 24 through 26. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now you can continue to hold that, that, your Bible open right there. Just listen. There are two other places that the Bible uses the word propitiation. The New Testament uses the word propitiation. This is Hebrews 2, 16 through 18. Just listen. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation. For the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And then earlier in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 3, John actually uses the word prior to our text that we're going to examine today. 1 John 2, 1 through 3 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Just a brief comment on that verse 2. You want to go ahead and look and flip over to 1 John. Hold Romans 3, but go ahead and flip over to 1 John. 
And if you have the ability to toggle pages, uh, you can look at this sentence with me in verse 2. This propitiation for our sins, and he says, not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Just a brief comment. He is writing to a primarily Jewish audience, and he's telling those Jewish followers of Jesus, he didn't die just for us Jews, but he died for all the nations. He died for all the races of people. And that's what the verse 2 means when he says, not ours only as Jews, but also those for the whole world, meaning the nations. Now our text for examination. 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 11. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let's pray. Well, God, these are Your words breathed out from Your very mouth. We receive them today as your words, with all the authority and power that that means. So teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness today as we sit under not only the reading, but the teaching of this text. In Christ's name, amen. So, you know, my previous treatment of these two Bible passages had a little different slice of a perspective. As I, as I turned in, this, um, in the opening of this series and talked about why the atonement, why the death of Jesus as a sacrifice was necessary, we actually looked at Romans 3, 24 through 26, and 1 John 4, 9 through 11. And we did that, uh, acknowledging that, that Sunday, that the word propitiation could stand as the NIV translates it as a sacrifice of atonement. But we were more interested in that sermon on the why. And I'll revisit motivation as a part of today's sermon as well. But just to remind you, if you go back and look at the... This is the one observation I want to make at the Romans 3 text. And then we'll, we'll let all that go and we'll, we'll stick with the 1 John text for the remainder of the sermon. But if you go back to the Romans 3, you see there in the second half of verse 25. After saying that... Jesus was the one whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. He says, he gives a reason. He says, this was to demonstrate his righteousness. So God's holiness, his justice demands, once God commits himself to redeeming a people to himself, his own character expressed in the law requires that there be a sacrifice of atonement. You see that at the end of verse 26 as well. So that he would be just and the justifier. So in some sense today, as we get into the definition of propitiation, we're going to see that it does have something to do with satisfying the righteous demands of God's law. So you can turn now to 1 John 4, 9 through 11. We're ready to look at it in full. And I've got three points I want to work through. Um, This is the most logical order. Um, but then there's a sort of an additional logic for why I'm going to examine them in a little different order. But here are the three points. Motive, deed, result. Motive. You're going to see in 1 John, the motive is love. You're going to see the deed. The deed is propitiation. And the result is a changed life for us. Love. So that's the, that's the sermon. Motive, deed, and result. And we're going to see it in uh, verse 10. And part of verse 11. When I, when I preached that necessity of the atonement, it wasn't just God's holiness, but it was also this twin or this second fountain out of which the giving of Jesus comes, the very love of God. And so the way I'm going to come at this, I'm going to start with the definition of the deed. I'm going to start with point two first. And that's going to help us understand why we need to talk about the motive of love, which I'll get to second. 
And then we'll close with some applications about this result. We need to begin with a definition in order to understand the motivation. What is a propitiation, right? Um, anybody have a, have a Bible translation this morning other than the ESV? What, what you got? What's the translation you have? NIV. Okay, the NIV. It says atoning sacrifice. A toning sacrifice. Is that a newer NIV? Is that a recent purchase? No? Okay, so sacrifice of atonement or atoning sacrifice. That is the way the NIV translated that word. Some of you have the NIV as I see you. I see those heads. You're nodding, yes. Uh, anything else? I know that the Revised Standard Version as well as the New Revised Standard Version have the word expiation, which is like almost as difficult, right? Like, what does that mean? So I need to get at this. First, let me note this. These are not Greek words. Right, this is, I'm not trying to unfold something that's in the original. I am trying to unfold something in the original text, okay? But not these, these particular words are translations of the concepts that are in the original text. And they are good English words. They do have their roots in Latin. As a fact, as a part of my research for this sermon, I went back and I looked at the, uh, at the Vulgate, the, the historic Latin text of the church, and I was, and it was um, fascinated to find... Propitiatione. Propitiation. It is a Latin term that we have taken over into English. And it simply means a sacrifice given to the gods, or in this case, the one God, in order to appease his wrath. It is the translation of a much older term, a Hebrew term, which meant to cover to cover the sins of in the Old Testament. And then in this Greek context in which the New Testament gets written, this is the word, hilasterion. This is the Greek term, hilasterion, that, that really comes to signify the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid, the box of the, of the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament, because that's the place where the blood was sprinkled. That's the place where the atoning sacrifice was applied. This is a complicated term, but if we could distill it, it means a sacrifice that satisfies God's judicial wrath. God's law requires a response when it is transgressed, a legal response, and that's important. So, why all the big deal? Well, I set this up last Sunday and uh, for those of you who weren't here, I'm just going to rehearse briefly. So, in my hand here is, a, is, a, is an English translation of the, of the Greek poet Homer, his uh, war poem, The Iliad. And in it are many scenes of sacrifice. And I read one of those last Sunday from, from the first book. It was actually a sacrifice to the god Apollo. And it was a propitiatory sacrifice to him. We read about how the animal was killed in a certain ceremonial way and then how the meat was carved and it was prepared to be cooked well with the fat and then to be eaten and enjoyed by the community. And all of this restored, restored Apollo's favor to the armies that were fighting and it restored community to those who were sharing the meal. And interestingly, in that particular scene, both Greeks and Trojans were experiencing some reconciliation. Because of that historical background, there have been many Christian thinkers, theologians and writers, who have objected to the word propitiation as a translation of these passages. Because they say, I don't say, they say, it draws a caricature of God that makes him out to be more like a pagan God than the one true God of the Bible. So I did a little, a little thesaurus. You don't know what a thesaurus is? You don't know what a, you want you some options about some other words? You go to the thesaurus and it gives you synonyms. Sometimes it'll also give you antonyms. It'll give you the opposite of. So I, I wanted to know what the problem was. And the problem is, is that the Greek gods were... Capricious. 
I want to know what that word meant. The God of the Bible's not. He's steady. He's constant. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He doesn't jump up off his throne in surprise of things. And he is never unrighteous. The Greek gods, they are, and, and consequently then the Roman gods as well, they are. They, they do awful things. When I first got introduced to this word propitiation, I was introduced to it by, by liberal theologians, and some of them being some of my teachers. And um, I didn't understand what the big deal was because I didn't have a strong enough background in these classical texts. And so they were, they were dealing with that and trying to make this big distinction. And then one day, after graduating from college, I read a book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. First published in 1973, and this is what Packer says about this issue. I'll get back to my thesaurus in just a second. This is, this is what Packer says. Knowing God designates a distinct difference between pagan and Christian propitiation. So here's the quote. In paganism... That is the Greek gods, right? Zeus, Apollo, Athena, Aphrodite, all those, right? You with me? In paganism, man propitiates his gods, and religion becomes a form of commercialism and indeed of bribery. In Christianity, however, God propitiates his wrath by his own action. He, go back to Romans 3, you can look at it. Look at 1 John 4. See who this subject of the, of the sentence is. Look who's doing the action. He sets forth Jesus Christ, says the Apostle Paul, says the Apostle John. I'm adding to, to, to Packer's quote here. He, he focuses on Romans 3. He sets forth Jesus Christ to be the propitiation of our sins. That's fascinating to me. In the history of, of this word, where people bring sacrifices to appease God and gain, or the gods, and to gain their favor, it's man doing a work. But if you read the Bible, if you read the New Testament closely, it's God. That's why I love being a Presbyterian. It's like, this is not news to us. We love this truth, right? It's God who takes the initiative and propitiates his own wrath on our behalf. That, that's why Romans 3 closes with those words, so that he, he does this, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we're coming to understand the deed. We're working on this definition of the deed. What is this? This covering, this sacrifice of atonement that satisfies God's righteous demands because God is not capricious. Here's the thesaurus um, search I did on the word capricious. The pagan gods fit this description, not the God of the Bible. The pagan gods are unpredictable, arbitrary, careless. I know my wife is now, I told me she's in the other room. Some of this is for her, because when I was first exploring these ideas years ago, uh, the only thing I could come up with about capricious, I would say, God's not willy-nilly. And she hated that, that phrase. And she would say, I just wish you wouldn't say willy-nilly. I don't like that. So this is for you, Hope. It's for all of us. And I appreciate it. My wife does a good job. She pushes me to think more deeply about the truths that we cherish. God is not arbitrary, careless, erratic, fickle flighty, impulsive, quirky. Sounds like expressions, descriptions of human beings, but not God, right? Temperamental, unpredictable, unreasonable, unstable, volatile. I think that's the one that a lot of would-be Christian teachers object to, that God is somehow volatile, wayward, whimsical, any way the wind blows, blowing hot and cold, changeful, contrary, every which way, every which way but loose, 
fanciful. I almost deleted that one, and I got to thinking about it. That's a good word, fanciful. One who is moved by his fancies. Like whatever, whatever appeals to you in the moment. And there's no continuity or consistency to that. Fitful. Flaky. Inconstant. Think about old school thermometers. Mercurial. God is not that. Moody. Variable. And it was thesars.com that put them in alphabetical order like that, not me. But that was a helpful exercise. This is the contrast. This is the distinction that we make. God of the Bible is none of those things. And so therefore, uh, this idea of propitiating Him, it can't be about that. Uh, we're not, we didn't lose His favor because He was inconstant. We lost His favor because we broke His, his law. And He, out of His love. See, now we're at that first point. The motivation. Now that we've defined it, and we understand the contrast between Christian, a biblical understanding of propitiation, in contrast to the pagan idea of propitiation, we're now ready to better understand this motivation. There's a great burden here. Is this really what the Bible, is this really what the New Testament means? We have a burden to prove this motivation. Let me first just, just note this. I actually got this from Alistair Begg in his sermon on uh, 1 John 4.10. Uh, he made this, this, this observation, and I think it's pretty stellar. In this is love. So you're open at 1 John 4, right? You're looking at verse 10, and he has this phrase to this opening line of verse 10. In this is love. He says, John writing is an old man. Right? right? So 1 John, it comes later in his ministry, after he's written his gospel. Um, and John lived, he was, he was the youngest of the disciples, and he lived longer than any of the disciples. He's the, last, he's the last man standing, as it were, on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, we don't really know exactly where he is. We think maybe he was still shepherding the flock at Ephesus when he penned these words. Um, and he did the revelation from the Isle of Patmos. But this is still late in his ministry. And so after a lot of reflection, Beg, Alistair Begg, he, he makes the point. He says, John is really saying, I get it now. Like if you'd, have stopped, if you'd have stopped John when he was a young man and he was following Jesus around, he nor any of the other disciples really would have had this insight. But now, after many years of reflection and teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, I get it. This is love. Not that we loved God. It wasn't us who took the initiative. We didn't, we didn't come with our sacrifices in hand to God. But God came to us. He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And if God so loved us, look, this is just like John 3.16. That first phrase there, um, so this is just like John chapter 3, verse 16, when it says, for God so loved the world. I'm sorry to do all the grammar work this morning, but it's important. Okay, The word so there, uh, looking at it not only in the original language, which you can see it there as well, but, but understanding what's really here in English. What he's saying is, is God loved in this manner. If God loved us by doing this, that's what the word so means in, 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 this, use, in this English usage. He did it so. He did it in this way. He did it likewise, in this manner. If God loved us in this way, then we also ought to love one another. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We're still looking at this motivation of love. The burden here that we feel is that the New Testament was written in Greek. And it imbibes that classical period culture and context. That's a hurdle to get over. But I'm going to join one of the church fathers on this matter. I, would, I wouldn't join this church father on all theological matters. 
because he has some problems. But I'm going to join Tertullian, the, one of the second century church fathers, when he asked, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Do you know his answer? And do you know, first, do you know what the question means? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What does, what does all that Greek culture have to do with what's going on with Jesus? That's what the question means. And you know his answer? Absolutely nothing. Whew. Now, as a classical scholar, I have to wrestle with that. I mean, I love, I love classical literature and classical languages and classical history, you know, Greeks and Romans. But I agree with Tertullian that theologically, we, even though God in his providence used the Greek language to make a path of communication for the gospel to the nations. That whole hub around the Mediterranean world, North Africa, Asia Minor, um, Palestine, uh, Southern Europe, all the way to Spain, they were all Greek-speaking people at the time of the writing of the New Testament. An amazing moment in history, a great providential moment. And so God is doing something with that, but that doesn't mean we're buying their culture wholesale and bringing it into our lives. In fact, if I were to wax eloquently on this, I would burn your ears about things that we don't want in our culture and world from that period. This is, this is, this is fascinating as well when you consider, even though the Romans conquered the Greeks, and it was the Romans who were in charge when Jesus comes, Greek is still the... Um, the language of wider communication. It is the commercial language of, of the empire at that point. And, and even though the Romans had conquered the Greeks politically, the Greeks conquered the Romans culturally from within. That's why we have a president whose name is Ulysses. Because that's the Roman name for Odysseus one of the main characters in this book here. So just a taste of all the connections of that makes the burden tasteable for why we need to make this distinction. Propitiation is not a pagan term when Paul uses it in Romans 3. Propitiation, hilasterion, it's not a pagan term when John uses it in 1 John 4. It is motiva motivated by God's love and he himself does it on our behalf. I also just want to mention briefly, I want to stand with Augustine in this matter too. You know, Augustine was classically trained, but he was also eventually, as a bishop, biblically trained. So he is informed, but he himself on this issue of propitiation makes the same distinctions. And so our solution. You know, we've looked at two things here. Holiness and love. And they are not mutually exclusive. They go together. They are the twin fountain. They are the double root of this tree. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this was, this was really, really helpful to me too. John Murray wrote one of the most helpful books on the doctrine of the atonement. It's called Redemption, Accomplished and Applied. It's a short book, but it's not a small book. It's hard to read, but I commend it to you if you want to try. It'd be a great read. Wait till I'm done with this series, though, because I'm using it a lot in what I'm doing. You'll come to church and be like, he took that right out of Murray's book. Absolutely. But what I was connecting was that in 1955, when he wrote that book, he made this comment. He said, God takes the initiative in these events because he is most concerned about his own glory. He does it because he has the highest love for himself. I thought, who does that sound like? What theologian writes like that since the 1980s and 1990, even is still alive today? That sounds like John Piper writing about how God is uppermost in his own affections. You know? And he's the only, God is the only being in the whole universe that can get away with that. Because he is the highest and best good for all humans. Like if God wants to really love you, what does he do for you? He doesn't, he doesn't 
protect you always. He doesn't make sure you always have plenty to eat. He doesn't promise to keep you from suffering and, you know, and, and the need to make sacrifices in life. When God does the most loving thing for you that He can do, He gives you Himself. And He does that in Jesus Christ. And so we don't imitate God by loving ourselves most. We imitate God by also loving, likewise loving Him most. And that's what He won for us by expressing His love through the sacrifice of His Son on the cross. The final part of this, motivation, deed, and result, right? Those are the three points. Verse 11, the last part of it. We also ought to love one another. In our time of devotion at home with our family, Hope and I have been, we've been reading the larger catechism, the section on the Ten Commandments. You know, those are fascinating questions and answers. What is the first commandment? What is the second commandment? What is the first commandment? Um, what, what, are, what are the obligations? And then what are the prohibitions? So like, what are the things you're supposed to do? What are the things you're not supposed to do? And then if, the, and then if one of the commandments says something extra, what is, the, what is annexed to the command to make it more? You know, it's just a thorough digging down into the application of those commandments for our life. How many of us, you can raise your hand if you want to testify, but, 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 maybe, but maybe not. Maybe you want to keep your hands down. How many of us think that obedience to the Ten Commandments is a motivation of love to God and to others? Like, that's not a ready thought for me. Like, I would confess... Like that, that thought's not on the tip of my tongue. But the more I meditate on the Ten Commandments, the more I realize that what they are are descriptions of how to love. How to love God and how to love other people. And so I could have stopped short here this morning, been like, are you looking at verse 11 with me? Beloved, if God so loved us, see, there's the motive. How did he love us? Right? And sent His Son to be the propitiation, to be that sacrifice of atonement that appeases the, wrath, the judicial wrath of God. That, that, that wrath of God stimulated by us breaking His own law. Law that is the reflection of His own character. He loved us by doing that. If He did that, if He showed His love to us in that way, this ought to birth out of us a, a, a love born of gratitude for all God's done. And look at that word, ought. We also ought to love one another. It's like non-negotiable. But here's the deal, and I'll give this. Here's a little nugget you can take home. Obedience is not legalism. And as soon as you start talking about, about obeying God and being righteous, people want to say, you're not emphasizing grace anymore. That's not true. Because the only true obedience we can ever give has to be born out of the power of God's grace. Obedience, apart from the grace of God, is no obedience. I mean, you're really shaking your fist at God at that point if you're trying to obey Him apart from His grace. As, as, as the Reformed, as the, as, the, as the heirs of the Reformation, we should not be afraid to talk about the law. I guess just give you one example of what I'm talking about. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, one of our elders helped me think through this this week. Um, so this is actually not, not this is somebody else's thought. Uh, but I'm passing it on to you. Um, as we think about obedience and righteousness, right? People want to say uh, social justice, isn't that? It, that's the gospel. And I've made this point many times. Uh, social justice is not the gospel, right? It's an application of the gospel. Now, our love for our fellow human beings is a necessary act of obedience born out of the gospel's work in our life. And I want to try to root that in these commandments a little bit before we stop. But as the reform, this shouldn't shock us. We are ready to talk about obedience because we know obedience is not legalism. We know that obedience is the appropriate expression of gratitude for God's grace. Treating other human beings with the dignity that is worthy of the image of God that is in them. Follow that? Treating other human beings with the dignity that is worthy of the image of God that is in them. 
It's an expression of gratitude for God's grace. It's an act of obedience born out of God's working in our hearts. That's what John says. Look back at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, sending His Son to rescue us through this act of redemption, then we also ought to love one another. So there's two tables. Commands 1 through 4 about honoring God. No other gods. Don't make any idols. And don't misuse my name. And every one day in seven, gather with other believers and worship Him. You want to love God? Make those four things paramount in your mind. Guard your tongue, guard your actions, guard your heart for God alone. And make the pattern of your life one that centers around regular worship, week in and week out. Table two, loving your neighbor. Commands 5 through 10. Someone else helped me this week to even think about these things as a principle of generosity. It begins in the home, but has applications to all those in authority. Honor your parents. Honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you in the land, right? Cherish the sanctity of human life. Murder is not just about, I mean, do not murder. Thou shalt not murder. That is not just about you refraining from killing people. You'd be like, well, I believe I'm going to go to heaven. How many of you heard this? I'm, I believe I'm going to go to heaven someday because, well, at least I've never killed anybody. Right? You might have wanted to. Jesus says that's a problem, right? But at least you never killed anybody. Go and spend some time with Westminster Larger Catechism on, the, on this commandment, on the sixth commandment, and you will find out that obeying the sixth commandment in its obligations and its prohibitions is much deeper. It's really about cherishing the sanctity of human life. Honor the sacredness of marriage. You know, in thought, word, and in deed. Honor the sacredness of marriage. It's, you know, maybe, maybe the commandment is so simple, don't commit adultery. And it's really a word that includes all forms of sexual sin. But our spiritual forebears knew that and they expanded its application and really, to summarize it, honor the sacredness of marriage between one man and one woman. And then, 8, 9, and 10, don't lie, don't, um, yeah, don't bear false witness, and don't, well, my brain is just fried. Don't steal other people's possessions and don't lie and don't covet. Right? Respect the rights of fellow humans, their property and their reputation. Somebody said, a love for others is more than an enshrinement of capitalism. But we still have to respect what belongs to other people. It's an act of love. And that includes more than just their property, but also their reputation. So here's my conclusion, brothers. And sisters. Love, propitiation, love. God's love gives us the sacrifice of atonement and satisfies His law, and it births real love out of our hearts. That's not just about the sentiment of how you feel, but gets down into the way that we live. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this this morning. Motive, deed, and result. We pray, God, that it will inform our week, indeed inform the rest of our lives, until we see you face to face. Jesus is the foundation and fountain upon which all of this is built. His person, His work, the sacrifice at Calvary, O oh Lord, it is the cornerstone of all that you've given what we've received, and all that we do. Help us to plant our feet firmly there. In Jesus' name, amen.